So um, welcome to our Braunbeck seminar this week. Um, I'm uh, glad to uh, welcome you all to our presentation this week by Vladimir Vuchkovic, who is uh, a visiting fellow um, at the moment uh, at the Center for Southeast European Studies uh, here in Graz. He is also uh, in his uh, main job, a lecturer at the Department of International Relations and European Studies at the Masaryk University in Brno, uh, Czech Republic. And he um, has been working extensively on Montenegro and in fact, just recently published a book entitled Europeanizing Montenegro, the European Union, the Rule of Law and Regional Cooperation, which was published with Lexington Books just a few months ago. Um, and his uh, current research, which he'll be presenting, is about Serbian-Montenegrin relations, one which have gotten increasing attention, in fact, in recent months over uh, the, the, the sort of questions of identity, religion, and so on in Montenegro. So he'll be presenting his ongoing research um, called Colliding Neighbors, Serbia and Montenegro in the Post-Yugoslav Context, Identity and Interest Representation. So Vladimir, the floor is yours, but before I give you the floor, just a reminder to all of, the, uh, all of our uh, viewers, you're welcome to um, ask questions in the chat or in the raise hand uh, function through the raise hand function afterwards. Please keep your cameras and microphones turned off during the presentations. Afterwards, of course, we are very happy to see you in person and you're able to ask any questions or make comments you have uh, at that moment. So without the further ado, over to you, Vladimir, and looking forward to the presentation. Thank you very much, Florian. <clears throat> I'm very happy to be here, uh, to be part of the visiting fellowship program. Um, also, I'm very happy to share my opinions, thoughts, and the research regarding the topic which you have been already introduced. And it's been related to the colliding neighbors, uh, Serbia and Montenegro, by defining these sort of problems when it comes to identity and interest representation. So, um, <clears throat> since we don't have a, such a time for, for more than 30 minutes, so I will, I will, I will be <clears throat> explaining myself uh, in a sort of, uh, let's say, dividing this sort of topic into the four framework uh, based on the discussions uh, being provided by me for the next 30 minutes. First, I'm going to provide you a sort of um, introduction regarding how I position this research, the dilemma, why the relations between Serbia and Montenegro are very important, especially in the context of identity interest representation. Uh, and also when we're talking about um, uh, democratization of the Western Balkans and the future, let's say, a requirement which needs to be fulfilled towards the EU membership criteria. Also, why this research has been important uh, and significant from my point of view, what are the main research focuses and what should be uh, investigated in the future. Um, at the end, I will be also talking um, about the theoretical framework by focusing a sort of titular versus identity, uh, alternative identity, um, especially in the context of relations between Montenegro and, Montenegro and Serbia. Um, <clears throat> aiming to explain the further identity uh, problems that are emerging, especially during the post-independent uh, uh, period. And finally, it's going to be connected with, uh, let's say, three overlapping perspectives, empirically speaking, by analyzing a various social, political, and religious domain based on the relations of these countries. Very shortly, I'm going to say something about uh, let's say, uh, concluding remarks about something that I have been observing and what have been uh, conclusions so far. So since this is an ongoing research, as you already uh, tell, told us, Florian, uh, I'm also expecting that you are going to provide me a sort of feedback, uh, comments, critiques based on the topic being uh, provided. So uh, when we're talking about the positioning the research agenda by focusing on the sort of uh, research dilemma being investigated for the um, time being, I would like to say that uh, following the current results of the 2006 in Montenegro referendum, the current relations between Serbia and Montenegro can be uh, best described as a poor underdeveloped. The existence of the common historical, cultural and political peculiarities in these two states has not uh, primarily resulted in the improvement of the state relations between these two countries, especially during the post-referendum period. Rather, I would say that a further antagonization of relations has taken place. A number of occasions and events has dramatically worsened the relations between these two countries, raging 
from the official statements uh, of the Serbian officials made statements about the absence of Montenegrin identity. Also, decision of Montenegro to recognize Kosovo as independent state in 2008 and also to join the NATO in 2017. The questions of the existence of the Serbian Orthodox Church and the preservation uh, of its property in Montenegro following the adopted law of religious freedom in 2019. Of course, the issue of dual citizenship and also, let's say, uh, official participation of the Montenegrin state delegation to the uh, Operation Storm celebration in Croatia in 2018. So all these problems definitely have been affecting that uh, current relations between Serbia and Montenegro can be defined as uh, extremely poor and undeveloped, as I said, especially after the declaration of Montenegro independence from the State Union uh, of Serbia and Montenegro. Um, although the metrics of deterioration of relations between post yugoslav country was also, I would say, noticeable uh, after the breakup of Yugoslavia, the novelty of this research remains the fact that the worsening of relations between these two brotherly countries has occurred uh, not just after the peaceful renewal of the Montenegrin statehood, but also after the further actualization of the existence of Montenegro national identity in the recent years. In the recent years. So this research uh, will try to examine the development of the relations between Serbia and Montenegro by focusing a sort of uh, identity and statehood issues. On particular, the paper or this particular study will investigate the sort of broken relations between these two fraternal countries during the post referendum period. Firstly, by analyzing the problems of the acceptance of Montenegro identity by the Serbian state, by the Serbian elite and overall by the public. On the other hand, this um, research will aim to analyze how the state um, respond to such a subversive tendencies in order to preserve the achievements of the Montenegrin statehood by using a various populist mechanisms by the former dominant ruling party, D DPS or Democratic Party of Socialists of Montenegro. And the problem I would say on the, when we're talking about the identity interest representation, it's particularly being tested in Montenegro, especially in the cases of ethnic and the national fragmentation and divisions where these particular uh, features exist even within the family members, right? So uh, this work has uh, identified a number of internal factors as you were able to see that was representing at the same time a research focus. In particular, the paper has been identifying a sort of alternative identity that has been, um, I would say, uh, promoted by the Serbia by using a various or by identifying a various levers of power continuously denying the Montenegrin identity stretching from the existence of the Serbian Orthodox Church, as we already said on its uh, territory of Montenegro, also with the coalition of the Russian Orthodox Church, we should not neglect this particular fact, of course, the existence of the nationalist and right-wing populist party, uh, either from Serbia or from Montenegro, uh, the existence of the Serbian Academy of Sciences and Art, um, also the pro-government media by using a sort of propaganda, the fake news, um, existence as well, and the connections of the hooligans and fan groups, especially if we're talking about the clubs such as the hooligans in France, uh, the fan groups from Red Star, Partisan Rat, and so on, who have been quite connected with the Serbia, uh, Serbia state in advocating these sort of uh, anti-Montenegrin uh, identity policy. On the other hand, we do have a number of uh, tools of influence based on which the government has been defending the achievements of Montenegrin identity, stretching from the adoption of the normative acts that were regu regularly uh, trying to respect uh, the national symbols, uh, introduction of the uh, independent Montenegrin language, also uh, adoption of the normative acts that was regulating the role of the Serbian Orthodox Church and the uh, uh, preservation of its religious property on the territory of M M Montenegro. Of course, the support to the restoration of uh, uncanonically Montenegrin Orthodox Church, um, quite visibly seen during the last three decades where uh, DPS were ruling over the Montenegro, was seen in the case of repression against the Serbian national minority by sanctioning their employment in the state and public institutions. 
Of course, the case, as is with, with the Serbia, there is existence of pro-government media that were using a propaganda. And finally, this sort of support of the regional social initiatives based on which they have been advocating the, the proclaims policies regarding the acceptance of the Montenegrin identity and also uh, protection of the achievement of the state with the national as of the 2006. So the, this being said, the paper for this particular case will investigate the role of the political parties such as DF and uh, um, Democratic Front or the Serbian Orthodox Church as a key promoter of the sort of Serbophilia uh, being seen as alternative identity, focusing primarily on the identity struggles, what enjoy uh, the greater popular resonance. Uh, the, this uh, conceptual framework has been largely connected with uh, theoretical consideration, as I said, or theoretical framework being defined through the uh, aspect titular versus alternative identity, where uh, we're able to say that the issue of statehood, nationalhood, the national identity have continued to play a very significant role in the internal political life of Montenegro where the different interpretation of these categories between the Serbs and Montenegrins consequently affecting the internal uh, political dynamics and processes within the society, but also development of the political situation. Uh, the national identity dispute primarily between the Serbs and Montenegrins has a very long history of ethnic division. Interestingly, uh, the history of nation building in Montenegro primarily does not align with the sort of institutional theory of nationalism, based on which the establishment of the national institutions uh, will predominantly strengthen and also increase uh, the collective identity. Uh, clearly, this was not the case with Montenegro, where the national identity sentiments gradually decreased from 91% in 1984 to 45% in 2011, based on the uh, data from the last census, despite the fact that the country had its own coat of arms, the flag, the institutions such as the parliament, the government, the president, the uh, academy of sciences, and so on. Uh, yet, uh, the process of national self-identification was significantly slowed, not just because of the national elites were not persistent in enforcing the national identity, but also because of the conflicts, actions, and the events from the wider region, uh, with wider region limit the effectiveness of the campaign of the national self-identification. For these particular reasons, uh, this research rely on the theory of your situation with nationalism, based on which the national identity may change due to the various geopolitical circumstances within the fluid identity sentence. In such a case, uh, the case of uh, fate of the national project mostly depend on the national struggles within or with outside the national borders. Um, nationalizing elite quietly realize that they are competing in the marketplace ideas and in order to achieve this particular goal, the new identity according to this particular identity should be more uh, prominent, should be more related to the people than this sort of alternative identity. And this is primarily the case where the Serbian Montenegro relations, where the alternative identity may substantially affect this sort of titular identity, especially during the period of major political events and the transitions when they're focused on the sort of identity struggles, what enjoy the greater uh, popular resonance. Um, this also theory implies that neither institutional uh, national institutions nor nationalizing our elite are also sufficient for consol consolidating the national identity. Uh, as the advance in the wider identity landscape uh, favor mobilizing uh, uh, public around the alternative identity cleavages. What is also being suggested is that the, these political elites have uh, may have far less control over these processes than we actually imagine. And for this particular research, we are also um, claiming that uh, Montenegrin political elites are not being sufficient in consolidating the national identity as the national identification was primarily slowed down due to the high exposure and responsiveness of the external Serbian influences that has mobilized the public around this alternative national idea and uh, identities. Um, 
So we also expect that this is going to be particularly seen in the future when we, when we do have a major political advance that was causing and it will cause the, the downgrading trends when we are talking about the increasement of the effects of the titular identity. Here you're able to see a sort of simplified illustration of identity and interest representation by focusing on the Serbia and Montenegrin relations. Uh, in particular, you're able to see, uh, I'm sorry, this was just, you're able to see the connections within the various actors in the forms of supporting a various uh, integrity aspects, such as, for instance, connections between the Serbian Orthodox Church and the uh, the Russian Orthodox Church for support of the church integrity or a sort of Orthodox tradition or heritage in Poso or elsewhere. Uh, Serbian authorities was also supported by the Russian authorities, as we always say, especially when we're talking about the current problems causing the relations between the Serbian and Montenegro, especially if we see the case that uh, Montenegrin government already as of the uh, middle of the 70s has been pro-Western oriented. So there is a strong bond between the Serbian authorities as well as the Russian authorities towards the uh, support of the territorial integrity, especially we're talking about the case of Kosovo. Uh, but also some, some sort of issues that was being imposed during the 2014, where, for instance, Russia has been an ex Crimea, and it has been also uh, not directly, but indirectly supported by the Serbian authorities, but, not, but by, by not imposing the sanctions uh, towards the, uh, Russia within the EU uh, foreign policy framework. Uh, also, there are sort of support and connection between these two authorities uh, when we are talking about the conservative values and, and uh, perhaps far more importantly about the history of ethnic affinities. Uh, this being said, there is also uh, a quite support um, or quite cooperation between the Montenegrin authority until the 2020s with the Montenegrin uncanonically recognized, uh, uncanonically recognized uh, Montenegrin order to the search, and of, co of course, Montenegrins that have been identified as uh, truly Montenegrin, uh, Montenegrins who support uh, restoration of these particular churches. So um, having this asserted, there are three, I would say, main uh, manifestation pointed out to the strong existence of the alternative identity in Montenegro, therefore playing a very important role in the uh, domestic political discourse to such, such as institutionalization of relations through the establishment of the closer cooperation between the Serbian national right-wing parties in Montenegro and the Serbian state, mostly due to the reasons of preventing its entry into the NATO, a petition for revoking a sort of Kosovo recognition and the preservation of the canonical unity of uh, Serbian Orthodox Church on its territories. Um, Revival of the Serbophile discourse, this sort of idea and the visions have been predominantly emphasized by the right-wing nationalist pro-Serbian political parties, such as New Serb Democracy and Democratic People's Party during the past decades through the support of improving the bilateral relations between Montenegro and Serbia. Uh, based on their ideology, these particular parties can be defined as a nationalist, conservatives, right-wing populist parties, uh, whose constituents openly support the pro-Serbian foreign policy ambitions in the Balkans, including the Russian ones. As a part of the wider uh, political bloc uh, called Democratic Front, these two parties have advocated stronger political, economical, and cultural ties with Serbia and, of course, with Russia uh, through the form of the strategic partnership, uh, especially during the period since their partnering foundation in 2009, but also in 2014, respectively. Uh, these uh, parties also perceive Belgrade, but I would say the Moscow as a most important foreign policy ally in implementation of their party and the national programs, especially after Montenegro uh, primarily uh, joined Europe, uh, the NATO in 2017. Uh, a step forward towards the implementation of their party program started to materialize where the Putin united Russia and also Rogozin, Rogozin Rodina and the uh, new Serb democracy together with the Democratic People's Party signed a sort of declaration of the mutual cooperation in June 2016. Also, this uh, declaration was supported and signed by the 
uh, Serbian far right nationalist alliance of independent social democrats from Republika Srpska, and also by the right wing populist uh, Serbian Progressive Party, where the main aim of this party remains the cooperation and preservation of the orthodox values, as well as the protection of traditional historical Slavic ties between the Russian and the Serbian nation. These populist parties have gathered around the main idea of preservation of the Slavic unity through nurturing of orthodoxy sentiments, values, and memories, and the protection of the century yields old tradition, history, and culture, which is characterized by the connection between the South and the Eastern Slavs. For them, Slavdom represents the th thesis about the threat uh, to the survival of the planetary orthodoxy in which the West uh, seeks to destroy the unity between the South and the Eastern Slavs. Um, based on this particular ideological, I would say political postulate, the EU and the United States intends to undermine the Slavic rules, their history, their culture, their tradition, their religion, and perhaps far more importantly, to destroy the unity between the Southern Slav as the current relations between the Serbia and Montenegro might show. Uh, from this perspective, also the politics of the West uh, was reflected on the principle divide at impera, affecting not only the relations between Serbia and Montenegro, but also the relations between the all Western Balkan countries, consequently making a sort of ethnic and religious polarization uh, between these two Slavic countries. Um, empirically speaking, uh, the Montenegrin formal invitation to join the NATO, for instance, um, received in 2015, has influenced the, the no, uh, DF to launch a sort of no to NATO campaign. Speakers among the others, such as the president of the new Serb democracy and the Democratic People Party, Andrija Mandic and Milan Klejevi, stressed out that Montenegro must remain consistent with the concept of the Balkan alliance of the neutral country, together with uh, uh, Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, of course. Uh, Bishop Amphilokie, uh, the head of the Metropolitanate of Montenegro in the literal uh, formal, as I said, was also taking a part in the anti-NATO protest, cursing um, uh, the dps led government for, uh, for imposing the sanctions of uh, Russia, and so on and so on. So protests also called for uh, the referendum on the issue for Montenegro to join the NATO, but on the other hand, this situation was directly affecting the sharp increase of the pro-Serbian sentiments among the Serbian nationalists in Montenegro while carrying the flags of Serbia and Russia, the portraits of Alexander Vucic and Vladimir Putin, also icons and from the monasteries and churches from the Serbian Orthodox Church demanding from the uh, pro-Western government to withdraw this sort of um, urgent uh, decision to join uh, the NATO. As a result, we are able to see that uh, sort of uh, open anti-rhetorics imposed by the conservative right-wing national parties and supported by the radical conservative orthodox cleric greatly contributed towards the homogenization of the Serbian national corpus. And this is primarily one of the chief reasons why the Serbian minority felt threatened both because of the repressive programs and imposed identity policies, but also because of the proclaimed state foreign policy towards the Euro-Atlantic integration course. On the other hand, demonstration of the pro-Serbian uh, affiliation among the Serbian political elites and the supporters has led to the flaring up the existing inter-ethnic uh, divisions, nationalhood, and the uh, statehood dispute between the Serbs and Montenegrins. Uh, Montenegro's membership in the NATO, the position of the Serbian Orthodox Church, the recognition of the Montenegrin language, the adoption of the new state symbol greatly contributed to the Serbian minority rejection of Montenegro as the homeland. The claim, on the other hand, of the new Serb democracy and the Democratic People Party that uh, Serbians and Montenegrins are part of the wider Serbian nation and therefore that Montenegrin national identity does not exist had only triggered uh, a political revolt by the ruling DPS to straighten Montenegrin identity, in some cases, uh, quite artificially. Uh, 
when we're talking about the religious phenomena or the religious domain, uh, this is primarily the case with uh, Metropolitanate, as I said, the eparchy of the Serbian Orthodox Church, and especially uh, during the last two or three years and its active role in the interference in the internal political processes and also developments, mostly during the post-independent period where the issues of nationalhood, statehood and national identity um, still play a very important role in the political, but also within the ethnic divisions between the Serbs and Montenegrins. Late Metropolitan Antilochia was definitely considered as one of the strongest Serbophiles in the Balkans, uh, creating a sort of image of the hard and conservative Orthodox priest, nurturing a nationalist pro-Serbian discourse and advocating the strengthening of pan-Slavic connections between the Montenegro and Serbia, but also between the Montenegro and Russian, Montenegro and Russian Orthodox Church. During the turbulent 1990s, for instance, Metropolitan Antilochia often used a sort of nationalist narrative and uh, I would say ethnic non-tolerant rhetorics uh, instead of the spiritual one, celebrating the war criminals such as Radovan Karadzic or inviting the Serbian paramilitary leader Željko Prožnjatović Arkan to come and protect the Cetinje Monastery from the um, Montenegrin Orthodox Church supporters who gathered during the Christmas Day uh, in the King's Nicholas Square. Political opponents of the Metropolitan of Pilokia always accuse him uh, of spreading the fear and hatred in Montenegro, but also being quite nationally and religiously exclusive, propagandizing the idea of great Serbia, and also uh, trying to undermine, I would say, the state intentions towards uh, joining uh, the NATO. Um, on the other hand, concerning the request of the canon un can canonically unrecognized Montenegrin Orthodox Church to gain autocephaly, which means gaining uh, autonomy for conducting this sort of canonical church um, prerogatives. The political conflict between the Serbian Orthodox Church and Montenegrin government, but also Montenegrin Orthodox Church escalated after Montenegro gained independence and the uh, MOC request of the ownership of Montenegro religious buildings. MOC began to renew the request for the return for more than 650 religious churches in Montenegro that switched in hand in 1920, where the religious objects in Montenegro were handed to the management of to the Serbian Orthodox Church. Consequently, uh, MOC began, be, began taking over forcefully some of the churches uh, in Montenegro, believing and arguing that they were only looking for that has previously belonged to them. Although initially neutral, the government increasingly favor uh, MOC property restitution request, especially after uh, Amphilochia stated that Montenegrins are the communist bastards, and when the uh, Serbian Orthodox Church openly supported this sort of nationalist pro-Serbian democratic front following the anti-NATO protest in December 2050. Also, the state began actively supporting uh, I would say uh, the activities of the Montenegrin Orthodox Church through providing a free plots of the lands for building a churches and monasteries in the capital of Montenegro in Podgorica, while on the other hand, the Serbian Orthodox Church uh, priests, uh, originally citizens from Montenegro, were exposed to the detailed check of the reg regulated residence-based papers. However, um, flaring up the political conflict between Montenegro uh, authority and the Serbian Orthodox Church and of course the Serbian state culminated after the adoption of the law of religious freedom in December 2019. Uh, the controversial law has determined the property rights over the state over the religious buildings in Montenegro that were becoming a cultural heritage built over the centuries but also acquired from the state funds. Uh, it was stipulated that all the religious buildings that represent the cultural heritage and were the property of the state of Montenegro before the loss of independence on December 1st, 1980, i.e. when the Kingdom of Montenegro were annexed to the Kingdom of Serbia for the purpose of creation of the Kingdom of Serb, Croats and Slovenes. For these particular reasons, all the religious properties will be registered as a state properties. If any of the religious object, according to this law, had or the any of the religious community has an evidence that uh, they have been becoming the owner of the property the state will recognize and respect it. The law was adopted despite the fierce opposition of the Serbian Orthodox Church but also right-wing um, democratic prom 
where the democratic problem caused, I would say, the major incident in the parliament of Montenegro consequently arresting more than 80 MPs for obstructing the parliament session. As the law was viewed as a discriminatory and directly uh, created against the Serbian Orthodox Church, the church uh, itself immediately, with the assistance of the democratic front, uh, monks and the believing people start organizing the so-called massive public protest or the street church liturgies uh, in order to influence the government to withdraw this court of law. Uh, disputed law was also a subject, I would say, not just of the region, but directly when we're talking about the Serbian state officials, especially the president of Serbia, uh, prime minister of Serbia, also foreign um, ministers and the present ministers of foreign affairs uh, claiming and criticizing the, 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 the government. They were only uh, taking uh, more than 615 religious objects that belong to the Serbian Orthodox Church, therefore opening the possibility to deliver them to the schismatic unrecognized Montenegrin Orthodox Church and consequently increasing this sort of administrative possibility uh, on the Serbian Orthodox Church to be completely pushed out from Montenegro. Um, one of the most important thing is also, I would say, uh, the fact that uh, for the Serbian Orthodox cause, there is a very strong support, very strong and mutual support, I would say, of the Russian Orthodox Church regarding the issue of uh, autocephaly, such as the gaining the autonomy of the canonical church, especially if we're talking about the cases of Ukrainian Orthodox Church and the Montenegrin Orthodox Church. Uh, in the dispute, for instance, that erupted after the Constantinople uh, officially recognized uh, autocephaly of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, the Serbian Orthodox Church resolutely sided with the Russian Orthodox Church. The same logic was applied by the Russian Orthodox Church in the case when the position of the Serbian Orthodox Church was endangered in Montenegro through the adoption of the law of religious freedom, claiming this sort of legislation as an act supporting schism while weakening the canonical church and trying to put it into the humiliating and the dangerous dependent position of the state. Uh, the issue of uh, autocephaly definitely remains the political issue per se in Montenegro as the religious and the political components are being traditionally interconnected, I would say, in the uh, Slavic country. Although the law has resulted in the substantial uh, deterioration of political relations between Serbia and Montenegro. This religious claim, on the other hand, has been used as an important political instrument in strengthening Montenegrin identity, integrity, but also Montenegrin uh, political cohesion. Consequently, this sort of intra-Orthodox conflict between SOC and MOC over the autocephaly uh, has spilled over into the political conflict between the Serbian and uh, between the Montenegrin state over the identity, nationalhood, and the statehood in Montenegro. Both, both Orthodox churches, which is important to mention, have been largely connected with the nationalism as the religious institution being actively involved in domestic politics, often aligned with the patriotic political parties of the government that advocate this sort of nationalist policies. In doing so, the churches become the symbol of the national being, substantially linked with the ethnic religious identity and therefore extremely politicized. Um, I would like also to say that uh, autocephaly or autocephaly demands in Montenegro has a very strong historical root. Uh, after uh, Montenegro Orthodox Church de facto was abolished by the decree of King Alexander I following the creation of the King's, uh, Kingdom of Serb Croats and the Slovenes, and then uncanonically reestablished during the 1990s, the cornerstone of the Montenegro Serbian political conflict exists about the issue of autocephaly and it remains the question of Montenegro national identity. What, with one advocating the Montenegro separate identity, language of the church, the other considering Montenegro partly and fully as a part of the uh, Serbian national corpus. At the end, um, I would just uh, like to emphasize three very important facts. First of all, definitely what is important to be seen is that Montenegrin authorities uh, attempted to manage the church and its religious properties more independently. Uh, that led primarily to the escalation of the national and the religious tensions in the region. 
placing the issue of the national affiliation in the foreground. Uh, since the autocephaly uh, demands in Montenegro needs to be approved and supported by the canonically recognized church, in this case, Serbian Orthodox Church, it is evident that due to the several reasons, above all, the status issues, identity aspects, and perhaps far more importantly because of the politics, there is a substantial opposition of the mother church toward providing the autocephaly prerogatives to the MOC. Uh, the political support, on the other hand, for the autocephaly remains an issue as the domestic political elite supported the church that is uh, de facto uncanonical and therefore trying to directly influence in a sort of Montenegrin domestic identity and domestic uh, in international politics. Uh, the government initiation of the unique Orthodox Church in Montenegro has been driven definitely by the political interest as disregards a sort of canonical law and rules by directly interfering into the church related affairs. On the other hand, there is a very clear interest of domestic political elites to prevent the foreign policy interference in the state affairs by strengthening a sort of uh, Montenegro identity, its nationhood and the state. Uh, finally, the state also provided a substantial support for establishing its nation church due to the national security concerns. As being one of the key reasons for maintaining the peace and stability in the Balkans. This is, for instance, why President Djukanovic, after lost his last parliamentary election, claimed that unlike the supposed 2016 coup attempt, where the Russia had the control uh, of, and its operation with the Russian agents for Belgrade, this time it applied a more sophisticated version of the hybrid war to Montenegro with the help of a new partner, originally non-political, but in essence, extremely political partners, such as Serbian Orthodox Church. And um, um, when we're talking about the conclusion, since we're already run out of time, I will be quite fast. Um, I have observed, as I said, this manifestation to the three mutually overlapping perspectives, such as social domain, shared serbo montenegrin identity traits, perception and the practices, political domain, the use of conservative ideology in Western patterns, and the the religious domains such as the Orthodox Slavdom as a phenomena surrounding Serbophilia and Russophilia. Given the prominent role of the Serbian Orthodox Church in Montenegro, I consider that welcoming of the greater Serbian role inevitably spilled over into the other domains. For example, the DF as the second largest party, while I would say praising the Orthodox tradition and the ties with the Serbian Orthodox Church, also use a sort of conservative anti-Western rhetorics which resembles that was being used by the Serbian but also by the Russian authorities. Rather than uh, representing uh, a sample of mere reflection of the Serbophilia, such a discourses are also definitely populist driven. And finally, um, I would say that uh, Serbophilia has been used as an instrument definitely by, by the political parties and by the Serbian Orthodox Church in order to counter their marginalization and discrimination in, the, in Montenegro. So I think that I can stop here. So uh, after that, we can, I think, floor and open a uh, floor for the Q&A session. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Vladimir, for your overview over this relationship and the sources of tension. Um, so indeed, I would um, now open the floor to questions, um, which means that uh, any of you can um, uh, raise them in any way you would like to. Um, you could um, raise your hands uh, or otherwise um, turn on your camera and ask your questions in person. So who would like to go first and kick us off for our discussion? Yes, uh, Jakob, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Vladimir, for your presentation. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you uh, too. I, I would have uh, actually two questions to you regarding the presentation. Mm -hmm. One of them regards the aspect of regionalism. Uh, when I have seen like the statistics of like identity, there are some regions in Montenegro with people declaring or identifying more as Montenegrins and whereas there are other parts of the country where more people would tend to identify themselves as Serbs. And I would have a question to you. Do you believe that at some point this fact might be used by some people who might steer the protests or who might uh, have some 
uh, sort of like uh, undertaking actions against like the security of the state of Montenegro? Do you believe that like areas that are more uh, like Serb identified might be used as a threat to the security of the state of Montenegro? Uh, and this would also like link to the aspect that you mentioned in the presentation, but I did not this I did not understand this fully. So if you can more elaborate on like this supporting uh, regional social initiatives and this appeal eighty eight, that would be mm -hmm. the first question. And mm -hmm. the second, and the second one is that you mentioned about repressions of Serbs. Uh, do you mean that it, this is like the sort of discrimination at workplaces of people who would identify as a Serb of the people who would uh attend the manifestations organized by the serbian orthodox church and uh was there like any further legal consequence of it like uh, where the people who faced this discrimination or repression like put any complaints to some non-discriminatory equality bodies of the state of montenegro or like was it like uh did it have like any sort of like further consequences thank you mm -hmm. okay. thank you Jakub. Well, I go ahead. Yes, well, well, when it comes to the first part of the question and this sort of um, social initiatives that were being supported uh, within the regional framework, this is mostly coming from the Serbia uh, called the Peel 88. This was being signed by the uh, 88 most prominent, I would say, uh, politicians, uh, most prominent public figures, academia members and so on that were supporting this sort of, let's say, Montenegrin identity cause. But however, I, I wasn't being able to elaborate it because I was being focused mostly on, uh, on these two aspects, such as the role of these particular political parties and the role of the Serbian Orthodox Church. So definitely I'm, I'm able to do that uh, even further during the, um, during the, first, during the next uh, period of time for, for, of research. So this is only the, the, I was only being able to focus more morally on providing overview of various actors that was supporting or being able to, uh, let's say, uh, use a Montenegrin tool as uh, something that has been uh, being seen as, um, um, as a tool for defending the Montenegrin statehood and achievements. So this is when it comes to the first part of the question. When it comes to the second part, I would say that definitely um, the government used the uh, the various levers of power to create a sort of critical divisions and clashes between the between the two nations. If I understood your question quite uh, quite uh, um, okay, and this is primarily seen in the um, very clear divisions on the referendum winners and losers that even made even during this per period of time even made uh, stronger antagonism not just because between the political parties but because because of the um, I would say the citizens themselves. So the country definitely, because of this particular antagonism is in the political relations, definitely entering into the uh, new political era that was being characterized and divided by the political party where the certain national minorities such as Serbs largely did not recognize the legitimacy of um, referendum results. And after that, we have been uh, having a, another problem such as a constitutional issue, the position of the Serbian Orthodox Church, the use of the state symbols, the Montenegrin language, all this remains the sort of fertile ground for the new political divisions between the Montenegrin and the Serbs. However, this situation is constantly changing. So uh, when it comes to the different aspects of the region, uh, we have been seeing that, especially from the, the last census to the, to the one comparing to the 1990s, the demography concerning the recognition and concerning the uh, support of the national identity cause has been constantly changing. And we have been entering in sort of fluing into that identity settings, which is even characterized even today. So this is the reasons why I do have a sort of problems within the identifying the national identity even today, because it has been at, entered by them or it has been uh, influenced by them uh, various alternative identities in this particular regard by using a various uh, events such as uh, or mechanisms such as, for instance, the Serbian Orthodox Church or the uh, populist party that was uh, trying to um, manifest the various ideas that are being prominent to this particular population. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So <clears throat> who else would like to um, ask a question? Yes, Mina, go ahead. 
Mm -hmm. uh, hello from me. Um, I would like to ask, can you talk a bit more about methodology of your research and uh, time frame and how, like what you have achieved so far in the research? Are you satisfied um, how it's going in general? Well, I have, I, I have started to um, investigate in this issue, as I said, as from October. So, so far I have been um, analyzing, as I said, two, these two aspects, such as the role of democratic prom in their political discourse and also um, the use of the Serbian Orthodox Church in order to undermine these sort of achievements, especially if we're talking about the consolidation of Montenegrin identity. Um, so far, I have been satisfied with the current progress, although there is a lot of things to be done. Um, when we're talking about the methodolo methodological uh, aspects, I think that these objects or uh, the main objects of this research are chiefly empirical. Uh, I have been uh, wasted into the ex description, analysis, and also explanation of the national identity issues and the controversial interest representation in both Serbia and Montenegro. So I have been employing a combination of various qualitative methods of data collection, stretching from the qualitative content analysis, describe the overall past and the present Montenegrin relations. Uh, also uh, normative empiric analysis, which aims to examine um, corresponding normative frameworks, such as the primary sources, reports, uh, volumes, um, articles, um, programs, uh, statutes of the political parties, press clippings, and so on, and of course, secondary resources. Um, methodologically, also speaking, uh, I have been focusing, as I said, on the, uh, on the aspect of the Serbian Montenegro, the countries that have been developing together for more than 88 years within the various political systems, such as the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, Socialist Federative Republic of Yugoslavia, Federal, Federal Republic of Yugoslavia and State Union of uh, Serbia and Montenegro. And also when we are talking about the time frame, frame of the research, uh, the paper or this research analyzed the period from 2006 and this present moment. I don't know whether I have uh, answered your question. Great, thanks. Um, yes, really, thank you. Welcome. Who would like to go next with a, with a question? Um, Maybe I, I come in with a, with a quick question while others are uh -huh. thinking about theirs. Um, what I'm curious about is, is I mean, you're, is, is the origins or the kind of the trajectory of Montenegro nation and national identity construction under the Dukanovic government? Um, because, I mean, you outline the resistance of the Serbian Orthodox Church to the law, which, you know, in many ways is unsurprising. So, what I was more surprised about is that this law was passed. I mean, that the, that the government thought this was an important battle to, to uh, risk an outright confrontation with the Serbian Orthodox mm -hmm. Church, because it's a relationship had been ambivalent uh, between, uh, between Amphilochia and the government has been both hostile and cooperative at different periods of time in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> also we see since the independence of Montenegro, this effort of creating a Montenegro or promoting the Montenegro national identity in a very similar template as elsewhere in the region. The promotion of a separate language, um, the promotion of a kind of distinct nation building project, which emphasizes differences to, let's say, the closest nation uh, in many ways historically, which is Serbia. So it's kind of following the way in which nations are forming themselves. But at the same time, of course, by doing so, it's very clear because, again, the, the demographic data and the political data in Montenegro has shown well before the independence referendum that there's a significant part of citizens of Montenegro who do not identify with this, with this project, um, who do not see themselves as primarily Montenegrins. So I, what I, what's a, what, so, so this process of building a Montenegro nation and Mont as transforming Montenegro into a nation state in one of the post, one of the posters you showed said, you know, Montenegro state, Montenegro nation, Montenegro language or church or something. And so basically this idea that all of those are the things which have to kind of come together in one um, is struck me as always very polarizing in Montenegro. Um, and my question thus is, two, is, 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 is the following, why did a government which was very savvy in controlling public opinion and controlling the system of rule do this 
Is it because it did that because that's how you build a nation? That's the kind of, uh, after independence, that's the logical next step and that's just what you have to do. Or is it that they were trying to rule also by polarizing? That this is my hypothesis. And again, I'm not saying that I have a conclusive evidence, but my sense has always been that they were trying to rule through polarization by emphasizing the difference of saying, we represent the Montenegrins, not the Serbs, and the Serbs are a threat to us. And thus you Albanians and Bosniaks and Croats vote for us because we protect you against the, the Serb threat. And of course, as you pointed out, the DF and the church have done everything to prove them right. But they have, in a certain way, divided, you know, the government, the previous government has helped the division of the country, and thereby, in a certain way, pushing people who identify as Serbs towards DF, rather than trying to co-opt some of them by a more inclusive understanding of what it means to be Montenegrin. I mean, this is at least my interpretation, and I'm curious to hear what, how, how, how you see this particular project of Montenegrin nation building, especially since independence. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that the government, you, you clearly mentioned all these important facts, Florian. I think that the government uh, used its, this sort of lever powers in order to create a artificial uh, critical divisions and the clashes between these two nations. First of all, I was seeing that as a part to consolidate their power and also to establish this sort of um, uh, dominance within the society by making artificial political crises and clashes, especially by distancing the Montenegrin identity from the Serbian identity and also by distancing them from the foreign policy, the, the Western policy from the Eastern one. And this is how uh, the whole concept has been created, the creating of the artificial political crisis and also establishing a sort of uh, divisions that can be used uh, uh, on the political level by bringing the four issue of Montenegrin national statehood and uh, national identity as a sort of unfinished but also a problematic business. And in these sort of cases, I think that um, the involvement of the I would say uh, political parties and the sort of uh, populist political political party that was using a various populist term, maybe not being a populist per se, but using a po populist term, they have been doing everything in order to consolidate their power and therefore are influencing this sort of internal uh, internal political processes and internal political changes. This is had what has been seen for the past 30 years, I say, that um, dividing and making a strong political division and polarization affect uh, the government to, like say, distract the citizens from the everyday activities, from the everyday lives, by pointing on this sort of identity and statehood issues as a most prominent uh, particular thing that needs to be done in order to get rid of the uh, uh, external influence, whether they're coming from the Serbian state, whether they're coming from the Serbian Orthodox Church, or uh, most prominently in the recent period from the Russian and from the Russian Orthodox Church. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Other questions uh, among our listeners and viewers who would like to go next? We have time for a couple of more questions. Go ahead. Um, okay, I'm gonna ask you one more question. I mean, how central do you think is the role of the Russian Orthodox Church in all of this? I mean, you know, because it, the, I, I, one hears reference to it, but at the same time, I'm always, I mean, it's clear that the Serbian Orthodox Church has a very specific stake in Montenegro for very obvious reasons. You mentioned the autocephalous church question, mm -hmm. uh, property questions. Um, but what is the, I mean, what is the the actual role of the author, Russian Orthodox Church in all of this? Because my sense is that it's, you know, of course, it it, it, it maintains the status quo. It has come, it has had similar issues with the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. So mm -hmm. there's a certain mirroring of that, which of course we've seen it with multiple Orthodox churches. But beyond that, how? Because again, I mean, my understanding is that churches are, you know. Orthodox Church is fairly autonomous, so you know also the Serbian Orthodox Church, you know, has links, but is, is is you know has its own agenda. I mean, just in the same way as Amphilochia within within as you drew the, the the Metropolitanate as a separate circle is quite autonomous from the center of the Serbian Orthodox Church because it has its own agenda potentially locally. Um, so I'm just wondering to which degree is really the Russian Orthodox Church important, or in in which way it is actually. Mm -hmm. Well, I I think that the 
primary object uh, cooperation between the Russian Orthodox Church and the Serbian Orthodox Church in the sort of um, uh, revival on, or preservation of uh, unity of the Eastern Orthodoxy and the sort of Slavic heritage. And this is, I think, the main, most important, the main goal why, this country, why these churches are keeping themselves together, especially if we're talking about uh, quite sensitive issues that uh, also uh, we had when we were talking about uh, demands for the autocephaly coming from the uh, uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church. So definitely, as I said, when, when we had the problems uh, with the autocephaly issues between the, uh, of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, when we have a case of uh, Constantinople, which recognized the autocephaly of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, uh, the, the Serbian Orthodox Church resolutely sided with the Russian Orthodox Church in this particular regard. So when we are talking about um, political aspects, they're not existing, but more like a um, sensitive religious aspect that has been seen in the logic of supporting the each cause being seen in, in the uh, autocephaly demands made by the Ukrainian Orthodox Church or made by the uh, Montenegrin Orthodox Church. So uh, the logic was applied also in the case of the Russian Orthodox Church uh, where the position of, of the Serbian Orthodox Church was in danger. The same was being done when we do have uh, uh, problems of the uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church supporting uh, the canonical unity and trying to put it in the sort of way that uh, this affects the both churches, not, not just the uh, Ukrainian or the Russian one, but also the, the Serbian church. Great, thanks. Um, Claudia, Claudia Lashtra, mm -hmm. do you want to go ahead? Hi, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your, um, for your presentation. Um, I have uh, two related questions to the, to the Serbian, pro-Serbian mm -hmm. opposition in Montenegro. Mm -hmm. So you, you raised the argument before that the Serbian population and therefore also the Serbian opposition as their representatives were quite discriminated in Montenegro. So instead of exclusion from, from institutions and so on and so forth, which is quite relevant given the fact that the DPS had such a strong monopoly also in, in sort of material resources. So when we look at the Democratic Front as the main representative of the pro-Serbian opposition now in, in, also in the last uh, years, so then um, the question comes up for me, so could you define for me what their resources are? So how, what are their strongholds? strongholds? How who, do you have an insight in who they are financed by? So you said, you know, they, they had strong ties with, with the Serbian government, but still um, the relationship between the DPS and, and the SNS in Serbia was also not always antagonistic. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then my second question, which relates to this one would be, do you see the division between the pro-Serbian opposition and the DPS really as this clear cut? Or were there also times of cooperation, um, or do you see maybe some certain resorts of, of, of cooperation? Um, um, these would be my two mm -hmm. questions. Well, when it comes to the resources of the, of the DF, it's very hard or it's very difficult to, to, to say, but definitely there is a strong uh, political cooperation established through the uh, defined uh, strategic framework of political cooperation between the pro-Serbian parties and the pro-Russian parties, especially if, uh, when, when I was telling you about there is a cooperation between uh, United Russia and also uh, uh, Rodina, uh, New Serb Democracy and Democratic People's Party supported by the some parties from Bosnia and Herzegovina in Serbia. So when it comes to the other aspects of the resources, it's very hard to say whether they have been financed or they have been supported uh, from different uh, types of the sources. However, there is also some sort of uh, connections between them based on the, um, um, the political basis, especially when it comes to the um, uh, um, uh, visiting each other, uh, meeting, uh, helping each other in order, to, in order to undermine, especially before the 2015, in order to undermine the state causes toward joining the NATO. Um, when it comes to the second question, uh, can you just remind me what was it? I cannot... And the question was, if you uh -huh. see the, the division between the, uh, the pro-Serbian opposition and the DPS really as uh -huh. their clear cut, or well, do you well, see some sort of cooperation somewhere? Mm -hmm. Well, this is, this is an ongoing game that is also happening even before. If you do remember that 
after Alexander Vucic and uh, um, uh, won, let's say, the, the elections in 2014, they have a very close cooperation and support from the DPS, from Montenegro regarding the elections and also the fit, division of, uh, of uh, uh, Tadic, uh, the current president of Serbia. However, situations are now changing. Now we do have a sort of cooperation and sort of establishment of the political relation between the DPS and also between the opposition, especially if we're talking about uh, uh, opposition led by, uh, by, um, um, by Vukjeremic or by, uh, by um, um, other uh, representatives. But uh, uh, it's also quite important to mention that these situations are changing, especially if we know this sort of chameleonic nature that based on the uh, preservation of their uh, dominance in the society, they will use particular every single framework, every single possibility in order to strengthen their influence and therefore trying to preserve these positions and their dominance. Thanks, Amir. We have one more question, um, and then we'll have to close. Viola, you want to go ahead? Viola, you're... you're... Uh, yes, sorry. <laughs> I was muted. Okay, uh, yes. Okay, so basically, uh, it's it's a bit related to the previous questions about the role of Serbia, and um, I think it's it's this one is a bit more, let's say, theoretical. And it's it's very interesting, also derived, you know, coming coming from the title of the of the study, um, where basically you say um, colliding neighbors. But on the other hand, from from what you explain, I mean, the role you explain the role of Serbia as uh, like a big external factor. And I mean, my question is, can you also put or position Serbia in your study? Uh, rather as what Brubaker used to say uh, or, or used to uh, call this as external uh, factors or external uh, national homelands, like is that the role of Serbia in this recent history of Montenegro to, to a certain extent trying to undermine maybe state building and identity formation of Montenegro or you would rather explain Serbia's, um, let's say, influence or role as that of an, let's say to say the least, an unconstructive neighbor. Well, I would say that it's very hard now to say, but mostly I would use it as a as a as an example of the uh, some sort of uh, influence from the external perspective. Officially, uh, if you see the statements from the Serbian officials, they do not want to interfere into internal political processes, but they have been using various mechanisms, as I said, through the Serbian Orthodox Church, political parties, media, in order to provide a sort of influence. So I think this is, can be quite a good point to position my research uh, in the terms of the, uh, of, let's say, external aspect influence, and therefore the role of Serbian actor into these particular processes. Okay, great. Thanks for, thanks for the questions. Thanks for the answers. Uh, we're uh, over time, so we'll have to wrap it up here. Vladimir, thank you very much for presenting your work in progress. Um, and we're looking forward to reading the publications which will come from it. And so I'll say thanks to everybody else and see you soon at our next Brownback seminar. All the best.